Hi everyone, welcome to the second video blog for the Billion Molecules Against COVID-19 Jedi Grand Challenge. So today we have a number of updates and we have a guest interview with Andrea Thorn. We decided to focus on a number of protein targets, namely Tricy-like protease, the transmembrane protease, papin-like protease, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the nucleocapsid and the spike protein. The proteases will be analyzed with a protease cleavage assay, which is a FRET assay, which is very rapid. Whereas the other proteins will be analyzed with microscale thermophoresis, which is using the equipment from Nanotempertech. So you can go to their website and look at the exact specifics of the machine. Basically, we will use the Dianthus, the left machine, for a quick yes or no answer, whereas we will use the NT automated to do 12 point uh, binding assays. Okay, so now I'd like to give the word to Andrea Thorn from the Coronavirus Structural Task Force. My name is Andrea Thorn. I lead the Coronavirus Structural Task Force who's supplying structures for modeling and simulation tasks um, from SARS and SARS-CoV-2. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more in detail what we are doing. So coronavirus. This is what it looks from the inside. And this, these are also the pictures that we are currently seeing everywhere, where you can see um, the nucleocapsid on the inside, the RNA, and on the outside, the spikes. However, this is of course not the entire protein um, that is produced because the RNA codes for certain things that are only um, built once a house cell is infected. So, the virus uses these spikes that you can see in green on the outside to fuse to a host cell, puts its RNA in, and then from the RNA produces a little like factory of micelles, bilipid membranes in which several proteins are tethered. And in those vesicles, it produces new viruses that then are excreted from the host cell. The virus in total has 28 proteins plus the single-stranded RNA 29 macromolecules. 16 are called non-structural proteins. Eight are so-called accessory proteins. We know very little about them, only that in, vi in vitro they are not absolutely necessary. And four HAL proteins, the envelope, membrane, spike, and nucleocapsid. Now, out of these, only a handful has been structurally determined. Um, they are shown in this graphic that you can see here. Um, the number here refers to the number of structures that have been experimentally determined. And these are all the ones that we know something about in terms of three-dimensional coordinates. Of course, most protein structures come from the main protease, which has undergone extensive screening. In total, there are approximately 500 structures of today. Where do these structures come from? Well, for you as modeling people or simulators or drug designers, they come from the PDB, the protein data bank. But of course, they have to get there somehow. And that's how we come in. We are structural biologists and we measure those structures by experimental methods. So that would be X-ray crystallography, the, you could call her the grandmother of structure determination. She basically is responsible for there being a field of structural biology and molecular biology and modern genetics, because crystallography first told us what proteins look like, nuclear magnetic resonance, and cryo-EM. All these techniques have something in common, and that is after biological preparation and data measurement, the data have to be interpreted with a model. So the three-dimensional structure that you see in the PDB is not the direct outcome of the experiment. It is merely a model that explained what has been measured in the experiment, which means that these models are of course prone to errors. They are then used to answer biological questions or for downstream methods, and that's you. However, structural biologists are not always aware that their structures are getting used quite a lot 
about 99% of people who download from the PDB are thought to be downstream users and not structural biologists that directly interpret the data. Problems with this process in which the model is used to interpret the data is that, well, sometimes you get a nice science paper, but it has to be retracted because the structure was wrong. Or you get ligands like this, which have, well, slightly doubtful geometry. Now, these things, I mean, retractions, of course, don't happen so often, but little errors, problems in processing, suboptimal structure solution, a loop that couldn't be modeled, a ligand that isn't bound quite right, happen all the time, even in the best groups. They are just a matter of fact of life. And the tribute really has to go to the structural biologists who solve structures nonetheless. Our models are fitting the data only to about 80%. So the interpretation of the data is very difficult. And this is why we have errors. In this current corona crisis, we also get a lot of errors as before with SARS because structures are solved under high pressure to put them out as early as possible to help other researchers. So this is where we come in. We are a bunch of methods developers. Usually we develop the software that other people use to solve structures. But now we look what can be better about those structures. We reprocess the data, we re-refine the structures, we validate them, vet them and check them and see how good they really are. This is us. We are in total 14 people from seven countries. We are also specialists in solving structures, of course. And we validate and reprocess structures from SARS, SARS-CoV-2, the current coronavirus causing COVID-19, and selected human interaction partners. Our major collaboration partners are 3D Bionauts, Folding at Home, Mall SSI, and of course, the EU JEDI Challenge, the COVID-19 Grand Challenge, which you are participating in. Where can you find us? Well, we have a homepage, insidecorona.net, which gives you background knowledge, data, and resources, a GitHub from which you can download the structures that we have checked and reprocessed if necessary. And our data are also to be found on MOL SSI, where you can in addition find resources for, for example, simulation inputs and trajectories. And where you are also asked to interact with the MOLE SSI people for your results as soon as you're willing to share them with someone else. So I'll give, give you a quick tour of the homepage now. This is the homepage. Um, when you come to it, there are two links to the blog posts on top. You can go on to the scientific blog posts by clicking for the scientists or news. So if you click on news, you can see there are a number of blog posts. These are split into scientific and public. And the scientific ones give you a quick overview over a certain drug target or protein from coronavirus. They also give you literature if you want to do further reading. So for example, here is a blog entry about NSP3, which has depending on how you count, 13 to 18 different domains. Um, and uh, Christopher Nolte and my team split this up and kind of like found all the alternative names, made graphics to find out which domains are there and gives how well the structures from SARS and SARS-CoV-2 align. Another example would, for example, be um, spike glycoprotein, which is the news block entry from yesterday. So here you can see a general overview about the different domains, also parts that we have no data yet for. You can learn how it binds to AC2 receptor, what the interface looks like, what the hydrophilic interactions are. Um, get some additional information on binding lengths, the role of glycosylation, and as always, in the end, you can find further reading. Now, say you 
want to use some structures. The problem is that sometimes it's difficult to select the right structure and there is not one best structure. So we give for all our downstream users some information on how to bet structures, which can be found in the for users section. We also give additional tips. So you can use this if you're unsure which structures to select. And if after reading this, you're still unsure, you can always write to us. You can also find here a table of the structures, for example, for Helicase, there's only one structure for Helicase, or um, let's say RNA polymerase and SP7 and SP8, which gives you some overview of the quality of the structure. And these indicators in the table are discussed above. So once you want to access these structures, you would click on resources. Here you can find a GitHub link. You can also find a Twitch link. If you're really bored, you can work as, see us work on structures during the day. And if you click this resources link to the GitHub repository, you get there. Now this repository in the folder PDB contains all 500 structures. ReadMeMD is your friend. There is ReadMeMD is everywhere and they tell you exactly what to find in this folder and how to deal with things. So for example, say you only want a part of this repository and not several gigabytes, you can use the script git fetch.py and in the readme.md is some instruction on how to use it. Now, let's look at a certain structure. Um, in the PDB folder, there are subfolders for each of the protein targets. Um, and we now look at the biggest folder, which is FreeC-like protease. Now, this is the main protease, but we decided to name the folders after the NCBI proteome names that were available very early. And we have never changed them because we thought that's a nice standard to link the genomic information and the protein names. So if I link, click on that folder, you might not be sure, is this really main protease? So you would then look in proteomeinformation.txt and in this folder, you can find other names this protein goes by from NCBI. You could also use readme.md, which will contain this information also as of next week, but currently only contains the sequence alignment. Now, um, for example, for the structure, so there are all the PDB structures in here. And um, let's look at one of them now. If you go here to the readme.md, here are the files. There's a validation. There's no re-refinement folder. So we haven't like re-refined structure. You can again find some basic information on which files are here. You can download diffraction images from an external source if you want to reprocess. The resolution, the completeness of the data, the R value, which gives you how well the model and the data fit together. In this case, the discrepancy is about 20% between the model and the data and Ramachandran outliers. So this hopefully helps you to give a little bit of initial information. Now, um, so much for like the short excursion into um, the data bank. And as I said, if you're missing something or if you need any help selecting a structure, please come back to us. We're going to try to help you. For some structures, we know more than for others. We have ourselves not looked at all 500 of them, but we've looked at some of the best models that were available. I'm quickly going to go through a through few potential targets that you may have selected now. So the first one is the most popular one, the main protease. It's a dimeric enzyme, enzyme that cleaves the polypeptide chain. So once the virus affects the whole cell, one of the first things it does, it has a very, very long gene and it makes a very, very long protein chain from that. And that very long protein chain has then to be cleaved into functional proteins that then do build new viruses. So without that cleaving, the virus can't replicate. And that makes the main protease, which does that cleaving, really a good target. It is also an old target. It has already been targeted in the SARS pandemic. 
Um, there are 209 fairly similar structures in the PDD. Um, and screening campaigns are ongoing where people actually bind drugs to this protein and then measure crystal structures of it. My favorite at the moment is 6Y7M, which we re-refined with Isolde, and you can download the Isolde refinement in a subfolder, which is handily called Isolde in that 6Y7M folder. The next one is Spike AC2 and TPRSS2. Now, TPRSS2, as you may know, um, is part of an important su supposed cleavage event that leads to fusion in lung cells. And there's the drug available for it on the market in Japan, but we have no structure whatsoever. So I can't help you there. You need to simulate the structure if you want to work it. However, we do have structures for Spike and ACE2, and you can find them in our repository. And the Spike, which produced from the virus cell, mediates entry and fusion. And it's been a target for an inhibition of this like fusion mechanism where it binds and fuses. It could be a potential for vaccine. Um, it can be used for antibody treatment. If you would imagine you have the spike and an antibody could cap it, it couldn't bind. Um, it binds to the AC2 receptor. It's also heavily glycosylated. So this picture is a typical structure and the little gray bits are the glycosylation. Now you may think there's not much glycosylation and it's quite true because in structural biology, we can only resolve the first three or so sugars. So most of the glycosylation will never be visible in any structure. It is still there and it is there definitely in vivo. So if you're working with spike, you should consider simulating glycosylation. Um, my favorite spike head, so the head structures, is um, 6VXX, and here the original structure, which has a very good quality. Um, some parts of it, like this transmembrane domain, have never been structurally solved, and in this picture I have been, uh, well, an educated guest. Um, this is the papain-like protease. Papain-like protease is um, another major drug target, but it's part of NSP3, and NSP3 contains, um, as I've shown earlier on the homepage, a lot of domains. So it's very large, it's got over 2,000 amino acids. And um, there is only one structure I'm aware of from SARS-CoV-2 for this part of NSP3, which is the papain-like protease. And it basically cuts the polyprotein, um, the polyprotein before the main protease. So it's the thing that is responsible that the main protease can be made, and therefore it's a drug target. However, this only structure, 6W9C, has only 50% X-ray data completeness. So it has a high resolution, but only 50% of the data that could have been measured have been measured. We are currently looking into this. The structure is not available yet, but it will be very soon. So we are reprocessing. We hope we can get a little bit better data and a little bit higher completeness and will then be available from us and we possibly also make a blog entry about it. The last example is the RNA polymerase. Now with RNA polymerase structures, you need to be particularly careful because ever since the first one has solved, there has been a nine out of register error. And I hope I can play this movie which shows the problem. So here you can see the structure of the RNA polymerase um, as it is in the beginning. And then during our re-refinement, we changed the out of res register shift and it looks something like this. So you can see that the main chain moves quite a bit. This is by the way, work by Tristan Kohl done in Isolde, which is a very nice refinement program. Tristan is also a part of our team and now it fits the density much better. So if you are working with RNA polymerase, there are now also structures available in the PDB that have been already corrected. Make sure that this error is no longer happening. If you're unsure which structure to take, I also here have a favorite one for you, which is 7BV2. 
and that's the Isolde reprocessing of the structure bound to remdesivir. Um, it contains, or RNA polymerase structures, because they are so large, contain several smaller errors, for example, relating to wrong magnesium ions. So be a little bit careful about, you know, adenosines being the wrong way around or cis prolines. This can all happen. And if you do some molecular dynamics type of simulation, they will form hotspots. Um, we have several re-refinements of these structures, depending on which one you want, you know, the APO or, I don't know, for an APO structure, I would possibly take 7BV1. There's a reduced form. You can find all of them in the repository. And I also want to quickly show how we look at these structures if we know nothing about them. For this, we use 3D BioNodes. So um, this is 3D BioNodes. Um, you can find it by Googling 3D BioNodes and they have a COVID-19 specialized page where you can choose different entries. And if I go to the entry for, well, the structure I've just shown, in your browser, you can actually look at the structure and look at the annotation uh, of the sequence while you're there. So this allows you to see different domains and can be a very good point of entry for things like residue accessibility or whether the structure has been solved completely. So that's about it from the Structural Task Force. Um, well, um, if you have any questions, you can contact us under information at insidecorona.net or through the homepage. You can follow us on Twitter. And um, I'm also looking for a PhD student if you know anyone who would be interested in doing structural biology methods development. And well, I hope to hear from you soon. Great. I, I was just wondering about the spike protein. So you mentioned that glycosylation is, is quite important. Is there? Um, a PDB file that includes all of the the whole glycosylated chain that you know that that has been determined by simulation, as you said. So is that already available from somewhere? Um, there are several sources um, for getting glycosylated files, but they have all been simulated. So I'm really hesitant to make a recommendation here because I'm not a specialist for the simulation of glycosylations. Okay. Um, I think someone like Romy Amaro may be much better suited to make a recommendation. Okay. No, I think it's it's very great and, and very insightful for our teams that you you know you use all your knowledge to actually vet all these structures, which I think um, for the simulation teams is a non-trivial uh, task for sure. So we're very happy that you are uh, willing to share your knowledge. Thank you. Um, um, something so about the glycosylation. Want, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Something, something about the glycosylation, which you should also keep in mind, is that while we consider um, the structures we can measure with CrowEM and X-ray crystallography and so on relatively static, we think that the protein spends quite a lot of time in this conformation. Mm -hmm. Glycosylation is super floppy. It mm -hmm. just like forms some kind of feather cushion around. Uh, the spike, which helps to keep antibodies away hmm. because they can't specifically bind. But that also means that there cannot be one fixed structure of the glycosylation. Any kind of like serious stimulation, if anything can bind to it, would need to take the flexibility into consideration. Right. And the um, you said that, you know, many proteins have different conformations. Um, so, for example, I, I know that the M-Pro, um, the main protease, has quite some flexibility in the binding site. Um, so, th do you think this is a problem, or how can teams uh, take that into account, or they cannot, or what do you think about that? I think that teams definitely need to look into this, and in particular for M-Pro, data available are really great. We have structures with so many different things bound and not bound to the site that if the teams would compare the different available structures, they could get an idea of the internal flexibility this had. And because there are also some inhibitor structures available, they could also see what the induced fit looks like when an inhibitor is bound. 
So I think that this is a very good example where looking at one structure just doesn't cut it. You have to take all the structural information available into account. And mm -hmm. if you already know what type of inhibitor you're looking at, you may possibly look for some you know, fragment or inhibitor that has already been screened at a similar. Okay. I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again for your contribution. And uh, we hope the teams are now super well prepared to, to go after these promising targets. I hope. I mean, we're still, we are, because I'm a structural biologist and not a modeling person or a simulation person, I'm very interested also in hearing what your teams are actually needing, wanting, and doing. Um, I'm not completely clear on that yet, and I would love to hear from them. The last thing I want to point out is that now the website is updated, so you can now start with submitting all your files. So just scroll to the bottom of stage one, you can see the templates there, and there's a submit button. That will take you to a website where you can upload all of your files.